Uh, I mean, it seems to me that it's emerged from uh, first from university departments with people like John Maida working at MIT and developing these early platforms that were like really simple, minimalistic uh, programming environments where artists could approach code in a way that they couldn't do before. So very minimal, like really simple mechanics. And then that, it kind of grew out of that and people started to get frustrated with the limitations of those early platforms. Um, and uh, as far as I know, that's where open frameworks grew out of and that's where um, processing grew out of. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like they've they've always inspired each other, and especially it seems like the ideology has evolved a lot from John Maida thinking that the best way to go about it was to make this very restricted, closed platform where only a few people could use it, uh, and then moving beyond that, people like Casey Reese decided to make it more open source and to expand it so that more people could use it, but also to make it so that more people could change it and adapt it and help it to evolve. Um, so, uh, how I would describe it is that uh, that community has grown from nothing in a way. And so when it started, there was a very small community and there's really no one doing anything. But as it's gotten bigger and bigger, people have more freedom to share what they're working on and it's developed support networks, especially through the same universities that the programming platforms grew out of, so that someone like Golan Levin can chair a conference or uh, work with his studio to support these younger artists so that they have a space to make their own work. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it's gone from being strictly about visual expressions of code, like moving from the early stuff John Maida making these abstractions from code uh, to people using the code to engage the wider world around them. So especially uh, through Kyle McDonald's work, like um, the the Face OSC software that he made, um, it kind of it engages the physical world in a much different way than that earlier stuff did. It speaks to how we actually move in space and how uh, we interact with with computer systems rather than just thinking about uh, the visual expression of a digital space. Like a, for me as a critic and as a writer, it really helps to have some kind of language to talk about um, that genre of work. So the genre of work that combines the digital and the physical into one more unified entity. So when the label of new aesthetic started coming out, I was a big I, I was and continue to be a big proponent of it because it gives people um, a, ta a shorthand and a tag and a language to talk about phenomena that are happening. It's not a question of are happening. It's not a question of whether these things are happening. It's a question of how we want to describe them. So because the tag new aesthetic exists now, we can talk about them as, as new aesthetic phenomena. And I tend to think that's very useful. Um, of course, it's become controversial for being essentializing and overly simplistic, uh, but I, I find it pretty useful and relevant. Um, and, mm -hmm. Well, I see new media art as really talking about um, artists using recent technology, uh, and it's artists confronting and appropriating and tweaking things that we've all become familiar with that we now take for granted in our, in our everyday lives, but we haven't thought through in an artistic way. So that's technology like surveillance cameras, like video game technology, like the Kinect that's filming me right now, um, social media platforms. So the new media is artists who are encountering those systems that already exist in our everyday lives and using them in ways that are provocative. And they push the boundaries of how we think of them. Um, you know, computer-generated abstraction. We, computer visualizations are very clear and easy to use, but we don't usually think of them in terms of the visual chaos that different artists have been embracing lately. Um, you know, using a connect to start shooting video is a whole other use rather than using it to control someone playing a platforming game on a screen. Um, um, social media artists, I think, are also an interesting branch off of new media art. 
and people like Man Bartlett and An Shao have appropriated these platforms that we all use to, you know, the stereotype is that we use them to talk about what we ate for lunch, but they're starting to use them to talk about how we exist online and what, our, what components our identity is made up of. Uh, and so I've really been thinking a lot about virtual space and how, <laughs> how, we, how we project ourselves and our identities into technological interfaces. And I feel like that we do it in a, an extremely wide variety of ways currently. So there's things like video games, which we all know and love. And in, in a video game, you're using a physical interface to control an avatar on a screen that comes to represent you. Like this little person that you have that you're moving around through the space is you. And the fact that uh, people my age, at least, have grown up with this kind of relationship to digital space, it's like we've been projecting ourselves into non-real spaces since we were, you know, seven years old. And so we are so intimately familiar with this feeling of packaging your identity into a little virtual character that I think we're only at the beginning of what's going to happen with that kind of uh, process and technology. So it's gone from technology. So it's gone from like, you know, I can pretend I'm a little Zelda character on my Super Nintendo to now then massive multiplayer online RPGs like World of Warcraft where you're existing in an actual social space online. And then even that's gotten mainstreamed with social media where everyone is their little avatars and they're moving around in these virtual realms of like Twitter and Tumblr and Facebook. And now we think of it as just no big deal whatsoever. A uh, long way to go. I mean, you can talk about Cao Fei's Renminbi City, which is a project that was done in Second Life. And it was a kind of ideal idealization or extreme representation of a Chinese city, where it's this epically chaotic, like epically intricate, epically dense virtual space that the artist Cao Fei started but it now exists as just its own entity and it's kept going into infinity. So like the fact that we have these online communities and like digital user bases means that an artwork can be made and an artist can start something, but it'll never be finished. Like, pe like people can keep contributing to something as long as it's open enough, people can keep using something and it will always be changing. So I'm, I think, in 30 years, when we see what still exists and what spaces still exist, that's going to be really fascinating. It's also really so. It seems like kind of a misnomer. I mean, nature is, is infinitely complex, and I think we understand very little of it. Uh, uh, but like the question of when will, vir will virtual space uh, move beyond physical space is... I think that's already happening. I mean, if it hasn't already happened that there's more going on in the virtual realm than there is in the physical realm, I think it'll happen very soon. Um, whether it's through games like Second Life and um, World of Warcraft and all these places, or through social media, or through you know these like digital coral reefs that we have, like GeoCities, that we've populated these places and then the tides have changed and we've left them behind. But their ruins still exist and they still exist as these persistent places that maybe we can go back and visit someday. Uh, and in a way, those things never have to go away. Like it's not like the ruins of ancient Rome where you want to build over them and you want to build up, bulldoze them because you need to freshen up your economy a little bit. They can exist as archives of, of of human life forever up. I think we're gonna find that we have a lot more freedom to store more digital things, but also we're going to have these weird digital museums that are like physical monuments, but their real lives are in the virtual realm. Uh, um, kind of like that seed bank that exists in Greenland or whatever. Like, all, all the possibilities of organic life exist within that weird architectural structure. And the architectural structure itself is like a very interesting artistic object, but it has no meaning without its content, which is these 
seeds that just hold the potential for, for the renewal of, of life on Earth. So maybe someday we'll, you know, crack a hole in the ice in Antarctica and find some ancient Facebook server farms or Amazon server farms and somehow, some way, there'll be this spark of digital life left and we revive it and all of a sudden there's the empty cities of old websites and old profiles. We should talk about three. Yeah, I guess the first time that I began to be interested in digital art or like um, internet art was coming across Corey Archangel's work, uh, you know, only a few years ago, but it still felt like a really seminal moment because it was the first time that I saw a contemporary artist really speaking to the, the visual heritage that I experienced as a kid. So with his like um, hacked Super Mario cartridges and like cloud animations, he was taking, really, because I, I grew up completely on the internet. Like as soon as we got dial up, I was just, you know, messing around in AOL chat rooms and like playing whatever games I could find and started playing MMORPGs and lost a year of my life to, to one particular one. Um, so that, I mean, that's made an incredibly deep impact on me and on my development as a, as a creative writer and as a critic, because those are the seminal visual experiences that I've had. Uh, as an art journalist, I began to notice a lot of the online galleries popping up. Uh, so gallery art spaces that exist entirely online that you could access through your browser. And I think that was another moment where I was like, oh, this is really where things are going. Like artists are creating work that's supposed to be viewed on the internet. And now there's this other wave of people who are creating the right context to view that work. Uh, and I think that it's not just, pe artists are always going to be the pioneering forces of visual culture, but it's when other people start to notice and start to study and understand what's going on that it begins to perpetuate itself, like to enter into the, the wider mainstream. Because um, I also think one of the chief problems with new media art and with internet art is that people, mainstream audiences, don't have the vocabulary for it. I think even more so than Impressionism or Cubism or Abstract Expressionism, people have absolutely no idea what you're talking about when you're talking about open frameworks or um, talking about generative abstraction. They have the tools they need because they have this, these digital experiences, but they don't have the vocabulary or the um, reference points. So I think we stand because I think really the art that's being made right now with these tools is some of the most accessible and interesting and fun art that's been made in the past few decades. And I think, it, so I think about if I see something like k Sirius's music visualizations where uh, it's a generative program that develops these really intricate, colorful abstractions from both from a set of parameters that he developed and from the sound that's being played sometimes live by an orchestra, um, I can describe you know, how certain sounds develop certain angular expressions on the canvas, which happens to be a building, maybe. I can describe how as the sound elevates or the volume becomes louder, the perspective shifts and the forms become more complex. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a certain sentience about digital art and about this kind of work that is is really powerful and it's one of the things that makes it really unique and different than art that's come before it. Uh, I also think that sometimes new media artists underestimate the power that traditional art can have and has had. I think as much as uh, a generative work or an interactive work can respond to its viewers, a Rothko, for example, responds to its viewers as well. It's so deep and so subtle that the more time you spend with it, the more it gives back to you. And the different ways you look at it rewards you with different perspectives on this thing that looks two-dimensional and looks finite, but is actually a really uh, complex and, and deep entity in itself. Um, that said, you know, something that literally responds to you in real time, action for action, is always going to be incredibly powerful and incredibly accessible to people. Uh, and that they look at it and it looks back at them, like they can feel it looking back at them. Uh, video programs. 
I hope in the future that more galleries will start to work with more new media artists and more universities will start to make their work more public and that we can kind of develop a, a greater sense of cooperation and community and erase distinctions like, oh, this is a painting, oh, this is a piece of code. I would hope people have, it's begun to enter the mainstream discourse that coding is this ability to make little worlds for yourself and to make to make things that alter reality on a on a piece by piece basis that's what i find so is that we live in in a in a world that's a hybrid between physical and digital and programming is a way to alter the digital world on like a, an atomic scale so by writing these programs and by creating art that uses code you're literally altering the reality that we live in and taking that world and twisting it to your own ends and I think that's something that n not that many people can do yet. And so for someone who doesn't code and for viewers of this stuff, it's, it's nothing but magic. It's like phenomenal. It just looks like the world is changing before your eyes. Uh, it's like, I don't know, the fact that this stuff exists blows my mind. Mm because it's like how, how I think I would use code or how I would like to use code is to shape language, uh, to use that, uh, to make a kind of hybrid between uh, language itself and things that alter language um, as a language, but to take literal spoken language or written language and use things to alter it in such a way that it uh, becomes something completely different that like, you know, words could spout other words, adjectives spout all of their synonyms. Uh, you know, a story can tell itself over and over and over again in perfectly literate, perfectly beautiful prose and never repeat itself. Um, you know, I would like, it, my, my world of code would be that kind of space of never ending, never repeating stories and, uh, narratives that could never end, or narratives that would go on forever and perpetuate themselves, and characters that would constantly reinvent themselves in ways that we're familiar with from our own lives, you know, from the people who grow around us and uh, who we never wholly understand. Uh, to mirror that in code and words is, I think that would be a really beautiful thing. Yeah. So the little the little digital world that would exists in my head in the little you know in my subconscious would be some combination of like uh, early video games and like eight bit sprites and RGB colors um, that I had that that style has always been really attractive to me or something. So I guess the, the virtual space that I grew up with and that I would live in is that is the language of video games and polygons and pixels. Um, I guess something that I've always found interesting is that like, just as words can create a world or narrative that's far beyond their literal quality, that like pixels or polygons or little uh, spots on a computer screen can refer to or create a space that's far greater than themselves. Uh, so it's up to us to take that information that's on the screen and use our minds, which computers will never quite equal, and blow them up into something that's human and living and alive. Uh, um, like David Mitchell's novel, Cloud Atlas, traces these like consciousnesses that repeat themselves through different periods of history. And I feel like that's like, it's taking the concepts of Borges or the concepts of recursion and perpetuation that we're now familiar with from the digital world and applying that to a more human scale. Um, so thinking about how consciousness could continue without being too sci-fi about it, like, yeah like how personalities could, could continue forever. Or theoretically, like, you would live your life and accrue all of this data and all of, all of these things that all together create a constellation of your personality. And then 
model that personality and put it into a computer that then future generations could interact with. So theoretically, like by the time we were all dead, people will have all this material and even this documentary to look back on and they'll see us speaking. And maybe if the technology is advanced enough, it'll be generative where we can like project our personalities and our own experiences into the future and answer questions that we never would have thought of or encounter circumstances that never existed in our own time. You know, or our great, great, great grandchildren can download the archive of our life and peruse at will. So, so I always think about this in relation to my Twitter. Like, I essentially have a real time diary of my life for the past five or six years, day by day, hour by hour, what I'm thinking about, what I'm reading. It's alternately terrifying and amazing to think that I could go back and retread my life like that. Um, or to think that someone in the future could go back and read that. Well, I guess I, I believe less in that, that like a computer could become so advanced that it suddenly was conscious of its own existence and could then, you know, take over the human race as that we can essentialize certain facets of our personality or our lives and present them in more approachable ways than we ever could before. So it's not about exactly modeling who we are and being like, oh, now I have this digital life forever in the future. It's more about even the possibility that, you know, 10 years after we died, someone could go back and look at something that we were thinking about or interact with some kind of very simplistic bot version of ourselves. I think that's, that's phenomenally interesting. And it's never going to be that the computer can model our exact cognition and our personality and consciousness but the fact that we can get any, anywhere close to that is really phenomenal. And the, you know, if, if someone a generation or two down the line of my family could speak to a floating head of mine on a screen, as, you know, as it's been presented in numberless sci-fi novels and cartoons and whatever, but the fact that we are actually getting to a point where that could exist very soon uh, is great. Like that's not a problem. It's not a. It's not an issue that we're mistaking cognition for or computation for consciousness. It's that we're even able to put those two things close together. I mean, that's that's a really good thing, uh, and hopefully in the future, it'll become more of a reality. Uh, I don't know that.